Welcome back to Making Conversations Count with me, Wendy Harris, your telemarketing trainer. In this week's conversation, I'm joined by Bev Thurgood. She's recently launched a book on how to handle the menopause. And it's not just aimed at the ladies over a certain age. She's realised that going through this experience herself deeply affected her work life. And further reaching to that were the men involved at work and at home. So whilst there is a 49.5% female population on the planet, I checked, I googled it, this episode is really for everyone. Because someone somewhere will bump into and be in contact with a lady who is in some stage of menopause. So Bev is going to share with us today some of those symptoms and how to overcome some of those challenges so it's not nearly as bad as it needs to be. So today, let's get on with making conversations about menopause count. Well, what's new, Wendy Wu? Well, last week, I mentioned heading off for a couple of days of in-person training. I had an absolute blast with a great team who were willing to take on some fresh ideas. We're all working in a changed environment where more people are working from home. So the way to approach reaching them has also changed. So together, we planned a simple process to involve a couple of new tactics. And I heard back from them to say that they have already been making appointments on the first day of hitting the phones. Now, they never used to receive any incoming calls or replies to emails. So we smartened up the scripts and now they're getting responses too. I am so excited and I know that they are as well. And a Wendy Wu shout out to John Bellingham, who got in touch with the show after listening to the show pay episode. Or should we call you John Wellington? Or was it John Bethelou? Now, Bellingham seems like a fairly straightforward name. And I asked John, was it a difficulty with handwriting? And he said, no, it had simply been misheard. So here's my question to you, listener. Are we really listening? Do you ask someone to repeat it or guess, hoping that you're going to get away with it? I'd like to hear more from you on this topic. Please message the show using the link making conversations count dot studio forward slash podcast. Now that was clear. Don't need to repeat it, do I? That's all the news from me this time. Let's get back to making those conversations count with Bev. Joining me in the studio today is a lady who is making menopause mainstream. I'm a lady of a certain age and there's certainly an awful lot about this topic that isn't spoken about. So today I am absolutely delighted to have best-selling author, Bev Thorogood, come in and joining me for making conversations about menopause count. Hello, Bev. Hello, Wendy. Thank you very much. That's a great plug for the authorship. Let's hope it's a prediction that comes true. (laughs) I'm all for predictions. And whilst my crystal ball sometimes doesn't work for me, quite often it does work for other people. So I'll keep polishing my crystal ball for you. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) I've got to ask, what's your background, Bev? What led you on this menopausal journey? Oh, that's a great question. It was never in the career trajectory to be a menopause trainer or a coach. That was never in there. So I actually spent a long time working for the Ministry of Defence. So 32 years working for the MOD, 30 of which working for the Royal Air Force. I wasn't in uniform, but I was a civilian working alongside the Air Force. Just, you know, lots of different jobs as public sector people often do. So I worked in finance and admin and all sorts of areas. And the last 10 years or so was in learning and development. I'm 55 now. And when I turned 50, can you believe on my 50th birthday, I got my first hot flush. Thanks for that. I thought, okay, here we go. This is obviously the start of it. Literally for two years, 
following that hot flush, I just went through, I don't think it would be too embellished to say it, it was two years of pretty horrible hell. I thought hot flushes, I don't know about you, Wendy, I was pretty clueless about menopause. I We don't get a lot of education. I lost my mum when I was 22, didn't have her to ask. Oh. So I, I just thought it was hot flushes and you got a bit ratty with people. What I didn't realize were all of the other almost quite insidious symptoms that creep in alongside it, the psychological stuff, the mental health connection. So I literally had two years of anxiety, almost sort of waking up in the middle of the night, feeling a sense of dread with nothing in my life that was really going wrong that I needed to feel anxious about. I just found I wasn't managing stress as well as I did. So obviously being in a management role, there were times when life was a little bit stressful in work. We had some domestic stuff going on with family members that was challenging. And whereas in my younger years, I just kind of took that all in my stride. I just found that for that two-year period, I just wasn't coping. And I was getting things like migraines. At one point, my migraine was so bad, I ended up in the stroke clinic in Peterborough Hospital. Turned out it was just a migraine, but we weren't sure because I completely lost uh, short-term memory, so a word recall and that kind of thing. So that was a bit frightening. I didn't really know what was happening. You, you mentioned perimenopause earlier. I don't think I was even familiar with that term until I started to do a bit of research into this. So very long story short, two years of pretty uncomfortable symptoms, not really knowing what was going on. Times I thought I was getting on sort of early onset dementia. I actually worked with a lot of women of my age, there were six women, all of a similar age. And whilst we joked about menopause and we joked about the hot flushes, nobody was talking about the other bits, the bits that you don't want to share because they make you look like you're losing the plot a little bit. So we weren't talking about feeling anxious. We weren't talking about feeling stressed. And I was managing those women. So I guess I didn't want to be seen as failing. And the pressure just was mounting. And so it was January 2018. I actually asked the MOD for a 12-month period of unpaid leave, which was something the MOD quite regularly granted, but they had financial constraints and they rejected it. So the idea of the 12 months was to kind of get me back on track, help me to figure out what was going on, sort out some of the domestic stuff and feel a bit more back to my normal self. So when Did they rejected it, did you think that there was another root cause for what was going on? I had no idea. I couldn't even pinpoint what the problem was. It just felt like I wasn't myself. My brain wasn't functioning the way it should. I was much more reactive to things. Can't even begin to tell you how many times I ended up in my boss's office in tears, telling him what a mistake he'd made in sort of hiring me. I'd literally moved jobs about a month before my 50th birthday still within the Air Force, still within the same RAF station, but into a different role. And he'd sort of requested me to go and work for him. And I just felt like I was failing. I was letting him down. I, he was only 27 as well, bless him. He was a brilliant boss, really supportive, but totally out of his depth as well. You know, the best he could manage was, oh, I think I know what you're going through because my mum's going through it, which wasn't particularly um, helpful. But he was very understanding, but hadn't had any training. He just wasn't aware and I wasn't aware. So other than sort of the hot flushes and crying, I had no idea that all of the other bits were menopause. And you talk about other bits and I am like a radiator in bed at night, which has never been the case. I've always needed an extra blanket. What are the other bits? Brace me. Okay, you're ready for this. I don't know. There are, <laughs> there are 34 sort of documented symptoms of menopause. The problem is, you, depending on which expert you talk to, you might get a different 34. So I guess you get a variation depending on who you are and what your makeup yeah. is, right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we all have different ways that we manage things like stress and anxieties and that, that kind of thing. So if we break them down into three sort of areas, you've got the physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms and emotional symptoms. So your physical symptoms, we're quite familiar with many of them. Things like 
hot flushes, night sweats, headaches and migraines are very common because they're sort of related to our cycle. But things that you might not realize are things that include restless legs or achy joints or muscle soreness or recurring urinary tract infections. If we can get the elephant in the room out of the way, things like vaginal discomfort and vaginal dryness affect a huge amount of women and they don't talk about it. Sex drive and libido can go through the floor. Other things like itchy and dry skin, dry eyes, bleeding gums, metallic taste in your mouth, heart palpitations, you know, like, wow, all of these symptoms. And it's all to do with the fact that our estrogen levels fluctuate so much and we've got estrogen receptors throughout our whole body. So as our estrogen levels drop, depending on where the body feels that decline, we're likely to feel the symptoms. And then as well as all the physical ones, you've got cognitive ones, which are like brain fog. I'm sure you've heard people talk about brain fog, where things like short-term memory problems, word recall issues, concentration problems, feelings of just sort of cloudy thinking, that you're not quite as sharp and not quite as on the ball as you maybe used to be. And this is where a lot of women feel like they're getting sort of that early onset dementia. And then you've got the psychological, emotional ones, things like anxiety, as I've spoken about, depression, low mood, tearfulness, rage. Thankfully, I never got rage. I didn't ever want to kill anybody. But I have heard a lot of women say, you know, I just get so angry and frustrated and it's just not like me. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge spectrum of symptoms. And because they're so broad, it's hard to pinpoint, well, is this perimenopause or is this something completely different? So how do you have those conversations today to help people then, Bev? I'm massively a believer that we need to raise awareness and stop brushing this under the carpet like it's some sort of stigma. Because I think as women, we don't know what's going on, but there's a whole narrative around women and older women in society and their role in society. So I think in terms of having the conversation, my main focus in terms of my job now is that I go into businesses, I work with businesses to raise awareness of what menopause is, basically, when and why it happens. Because again, we talk about women of a certain age, but actually menopause can affect women at any age from teenage years onwards. You know, it's not just a midlife thing. So raising awareness by having conversations with organizations, getting in and delivering training sessions or awareness sessions to all staff, male and female, young and old, senior and junior, to kind of break the ice, I guess, and start the conversation. Because if we don't start the conversation, it stays a taboo. It remains a a, a sort of something that women feel there's a stigma around. And there shouldn't be. It's a natural life event. It's happening to women of all ages, and it's a journey that will be part of our life. So the earlier you start that conversation, the better. But of course, women impact on men. So they're going to need to know how best to deal with the mood swings or the, you know, to be able to help with those physical challenges that will bring our emotional levels down. Yeah, absolutely. It benefits everybody to raise awareness. And like you say, you know, men might not experience it personally, but they're certainly impacted by it. Even if they're not married, they will have connections with women who are at some point are going through this, whether it's a sister, a partner, a wife, a mum, a daughter, even, you know, there's certainly a generational thing. I think people coming up through the generations now are much more open about conversations around lots of things, mental health issues, menopause, periods. They talk much more openly, certainly than people of my generation did. So I think the conversation will change as time goes on. But there is a bulk of people in in the sort of the early generation X's and the baby boomers out there who still don't want to talk about it. They still see it as something that's in some way seen mm. as a weakness almost. And do you think it's that they're not there yet? They don't need to know yet. It's like the other end of life, isn't it? Where, as we sort of mentioned before we started recording, teenagers have got the Miriam Stoppard of There's that staple evidence and reading and research that's gone into, you know, being a teenager and and growing up into a young adult. We sort of almost were missing that staple for ladies of a certain age that are going to go through this next cycle. It's like the the maid, the mother, the crone. 
I think you're right. I think that, I mean, there's a distinct lack of education around menopause for women and men. I mean, as of September last year, menopause is actually on the school curriculum. Whether it's being applied yet or not, I don't know. But they are going to be talking about menopause because we get taught the journey at the start. We don't get told about what's going to happen at the end of this reproductive journey. So I, my my thoughts are that actually the younger generations coming through will be more open to hearing and talking about this. They'll be better educated than we are. But we need to do something now to help women who are maybe in their early 40s, late 30s, early 40s now not go through the same feelings of ignorance, I guess, that, that you know, I went through. I'm wondering, because I hope my sister doesn't mind me bringing her up in this, but she was an older mom. She's younger than me and there's quite a big age gap between us, but she's got young children and she's going to have, what, two young boys. She, when she's 40, they'll still be in primary school. Do you think there's that shift that we're having our children later so we don't need to know about what's coming next as as soon because we're, we've not done with this chapter yet? Potentially. I do think that there's a danger that there are more and more women leaving it later to have their children. And the problem with that is that it doesn't put back the menopause, it's still going to happen. So I think one of the biggest changes for women over the last sort of 40 or 50 years is that our role in society has changed. So not only are women often having their children later, but they're also often in careers that they want to maintain. So and with the best will in the world, I think COVID has proven that the bulk of that caring responsibility, that family making, homemaking Mm -hmm. still sits predominantly with women. I know that's a generalization and there's going to be exceptions in there, but for the majority of women, they do all of the caring, they do all of the family making, they do all of the, you know, it, the all pink, of it. The pink jobs. We've had this on the conversation the, yeah. the show before, the pink, yes. pink jobs, where there really yeah. shouldn't be a differential unless you want there to be a differential. It's about choice now, isn't it? But yeah. Certainly. Well, I'm not sure there, there is choice. No, I'm because- not so sure that there is choice because, and I hear this a lot in terms of the whole kind of men say, well, you've got, you wanted this. Well, yes, we wanted equality in the workplace. We didn't want equality plus everything. Equality is about sharing everything, not just the workplace. So yes, we've got our place. We've got our foot in the door in the workplace. Yeah. But so we've when we signed up for this, female CEO, which I am because it's just me and my company. So I'm going to claim that I'm a successful CEO just for this conversation. You've got to basically acknowledge that I am doing all of this as well as managing the fact that I'm potentially perimenopausal. Yeah. It's a whole job in itself. It can be. And I think certainly what I've discovered through the research I've done over the last four or five years is that stress, unmanaged stress, it's a major problem for women in terms of their perimenopausal symptoms. It exacerbates the symptoms. And health in Um, general, I would say. And health in general, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So you talk about sort of cell inflammation and all of that kind of thing with chronic levels of cortisol. So what we're finding is that, yes, you've got women who are having babies later. We're not designed to have babies later. We're, We're choosing to, and that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that. But our bodies actually aren't designed. Our our hormone levels start to decline from the age of about 35. So we have got changes going on. And if we're having children later, we're staying in work, maternity arrangements have meant that we're able now to maintain a family and a job and a career. But it's all sort of extra stress in that stress bucket. Uh, And then, of course, perimenopause comes along and the bucket just overflows. And I think that's where we see a difference now to maybe what we would have been seeing 40 years ago. I don't doubt that women still had problems hormonally, but they didn't have potentially the same levels of stress and pressure on them that they do now. And it's just, you know, it's a bit of a tinderbox waiting to explode if we don't manage that. You mentioned then the research that you've done over the last few years. Was that in part to to put the book together? It wasn't intended to put the book together. There was never really a book in in mind. It came initially from me wanting to understand what the hell was going on in my body 
and why I felt like I'd had a complete sort of personality change. I felt like I'd gone through this whole... Bev version like, two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I didn't like it. So mm. I, my background, although I'd always worked for the MOD, I'd trained as a fitness instructor in my 20s and I was always interested in sort of health and well-being and, and exercise and nutrition. So I actually started looking... Uh, the nutritional side and the lifestyle factors that might impact on menopause. So I guess the book is the culmination of everything that I've learned over the last five years, because what I found, if I'm honest, people say there's not enough information about menopause out there. And I fundamentally disagree. There is oodles of information. It's confusing. It's contradictory. Some of it's downright misleading. Some of it's just straightforward wrong. I really struggled to find accurate evidence-based information. I guess I'm a bit of a science geek. I like to know that what I'm reading has some evidential backing to it, that there's some science behind it. We want proof, don't we? We want real proof. We want concise information and we want practical information that we can imagine ourselves putting into practice. Yeah. Everything I read seemed to be either promoting some sort of potion or pill that this magic pill that would solve all, all your menopause problems or the, the information was written by somebody who was sharing their own experience and how they managed it. And it was a bit like, well, it worked for me, so it must work for you. And we're all different. It does. We don't have that one size fits all. I couldn't find anything that was really pragmatic and practical. And then I came across the British Menopause Society and they are the leading authority in the UK around menopause. And I started to feel like I was getting some evidence of what was going on, something that had been properly researched and had some sort of efficacy. Had some weight to it it. and weight behind it. So I started to do more research into the stuff that the British Menopause Society was putting out. And everything started to make more sense when I looked at it from a sort of a more clinical point of view. So the book really is my attempt to provide a guide. And it is, it, it's only a little book, it's only 104 pages long, but it's a practical guide. So it talks about what menopause is, when and why it happens. It's not a heavy medical journal because that's not what I wanted either. That was something that I found it was either very clinical or it, it had no clinical evidence at all. So it's kind of a middle ground. I don't even know if this is a proper phrase, but I'm going to coin it. It's pick up and put downable. It's, it's what I'm wanting. I so would, can... It's what I would call an ed- <laughs> edutorial so that it makes you think for yourself. Does that yeah. fit for me? Does that fit for me? Then that's something that I'm going to follow and, and explore more. Yeah. That's what a guide is, is to sort of lead you to the right path, isn't it? Yeah. What I've tried to do is bring together lots of different options because there isn't one size fits all. So mm. It talks about the medical route. It talks about HRT. It talks about the risks and the benefits, and often the benefits aren't spoken about. It talks about the different types so people can make a judgment about what they want. They can make an informed decision about how they want to manage their symptoms. So we talk about the medical route, the sort of non-medical supplement and herbal route, and then the lifestyle. With access to doctors the way it is, and I think that's here to change, isn't it? That, you know, we were only having this conversation the other day that you can – kind of you ring the doctor and I think I saw Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse gone fishing um, it's easy it's funny but it's observational in the point of that you ring the doctor and you tell them what's wrong with you now you know you become the doctor for them just because you know what you need to do next uh, if that if your book can help in that way then there was a reason for you making that book happen I and mean, that's the hope is that it just gives women confidence around what the options are so they can choose. I think choice is so important that we have a range of options that we can pick and choose from because we will that way find what works best for us. Because, you know, what works for you might not work for me. We're different people. So, yeah, hopefully it's just an overview. And it it is focused on working women because I think we have different challenges as working women. And actually 80% of women going through their menopause transition are in work. So it, it you know, there's a big bulk of women that it will appeal to, I hope. Yeah. Well, um, we must make sure we pick up a copy, Bev. Thank you. Now then, this is the part of the show that I always look forward to just secretly a little bit more than everything else. 
because I never know what's going to happen next. This is the part of the show where I ask my guest, so that's you, Bev, to share that conversation that you had that created that turning point for you. Yeah. Are you ready? It's a really strange one. I haven't really prepared for this deliberately because I wanted to feel what came naturally. So I think the pivotal conversation for me was about my career change, I guess, because when I left the MOD, I trained as a nutritionist and I trained as a personal trainer and I was doing a bit of health coaching. And it was all about weight management and stress management. That's what people were coming to me for. And I'd kind, I guess, because of my own experience, got a bit of a reputation as something of a menopause, I hate to use the word expert, but a menopause specialist probably is a better way to put it. So I left work a bit clueless, never run a business in my life, didn't ever have any aspirations to run a business. But I thought, well, I need a bit of money coming in because I don't have a job anymore. Maybe I can just build on the health coaching. So I was doing that for a little while. And I, as I said, I kind of built up this, this knowledge base and was getting a bit of a reputation. I'd been left work probably three or four months and I got a phone call. And this is where the conversation really, this is the conversation that changed it. A phone all. call? How exciting. I got a phone call and the irony won't be lost on you here. From the HR manager at Air Command, which is the Royal Air Force's head office down at High Wycombe. And a former colleague had been chatting to the HR manager and the HR manager had said they were looking to do some sort of menopause awareness training, but they couldn't find anybody who could deliver it. And my ex-colleague said, oh, you want to have a word with Bev Thurgood? She's just left the MOD, but she worked at RAF Wittering for years. She knows everything about menopause. I have to say, I don't now, and I certainly didn't then. But, I don't think um, any expert could ever <laughs> profess to know everything. <laughs> So, so I got this, I was sat at my desk in my home office and I got this phone call out of the blue and this lady said, you know, well, we've been given your name as somebody who could help us with some training. Now, my background for the last 10 years had been in learning and development, so training delivery wasn't a problem. But she said, you know, would you be willing to run a couple of workshops, maybe one for managers and one for some female colleagues? Every ounce of my being was saying, say no, say no, say no. It's not what you do. Say no. And I went, okay, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me put something together. And um, I then delivered some, well, two workshops off the back of that conversation at Aikmond on World Menopause Day 2018. So literally sort of to the day it was World Menopause Day. And I delivered these two sessions. And as I came to the end of the session with the female colleagues, I had 30 women in the room and one man, very brave man. We had some great conversations and I was hearing all of these different stories from the women in the room. And at the end of the session, and I guess this is probably the more pivotal conversation, really. The man who'd been in the course came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, you know, that was really good. I learned so much. He said, in fact, I've learned more listening to you in this last three hours and hearing the women in the room talking about their experiences than I've learned in 28 years as a GP. And he was the station doctor. And my, I was a bit flawed because I was of the opinion at that time that doctors knew everything. I was you know, quite naive. They are only human. But I just assumed they would know all of this stuff. And I've since found out that they don't get much training and they don't know a lot about it. So he said, look, I don't know what your plans are. I'd been really honest about the fact that, you know, I'd not delivered that tri this training before. It was all brand new. So, you know, I was, it was a bit of a one-off. It wasn't what I do. And he just said, I don't know what your plans are, but you need to do more of this. You need to get out there and tell more people so they can understand what menopause is. And I drove back home to Peterborough from High Wicker, which is about a two and a half hour journey and my head was just buzzing and thinking, goodness me, you know, if he's a GP and he doesn't know this. And all of those women in the room literally had their sort of jaw dropping as I was talking with light bulb moments going off left, left right and center of, oh, my God, I'm experiencing that. I had no idea. That explains why I feel like this. I can make sense of this now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was just so that journey back after that conversation with the GP, which obviously started from the conversation 
that with that, that sort of random telephone call. So I made a decision on the way back from High Wycombe that I would start investigating and doing a bit more research into whether this was a bit of a one-off, whether anybody Does it have else has this. Yeah. Does <gasps> anybody else do this kind of training? I'd certainly not come across it. Uh, and that was the clue start. was in the, the first phone call, Bev. We don't know. We can't find anybody. Uh, well, there are. I mean, there actually are other organisations doing this and they do it very, very well. My thoughts are that there are millions of women that need to hear this and millions of managers who need help to support women going through this and millions of businesses who will benefit from How many holding on to that valuable female talent that is walking out the door because they're not coping. Yeah. So that was my pivotal conversation and it was wow. it's the reason why I now do what I do and for the last three three and a bit years I've you know I've been really fortunate I I went on to deliver training across the whole of the air force I've worked with companies big global sort of corporates right down to small dental surgeries across all sectors because it impacts everybody if you've got women in your employ yeah. it's going to impact and even if you haven't the men in your employ are probably going to be impacted in some way. So that wet awareness. You're dealing with it so away important. from work, yeah. It's really encouraging that you're busy doing this for, I know you can't name names, but when you imagine corporate companies, you know, with hundreds of staff, that to me says that there is change happening. Massive change. Certainly over the last year, I would say I've seen a sea change in how people are talking about menopause. I remember when I first started doing this, after that session at High Wycombe, I started networking and talking about this at networking events. And I could palpably feel people roll their eyes. Oh, not women's issues. You know, you think, Naughty. that's not going to put me off. That's actually going to drive me harder. Yeah. And now I find when I go to networking events or if I'm talking, I don't get the eye rolls anymore. So something has changed. Davina McCall, I don't know if you saw Davina's documentary, Sex Myths and the Men. Of no, Mars my eldest daughter ago. told me about it. And I just thought, okay, it was one of those things that I just, I mean, keep meaning to do. Don't know whether I'm I'm ready to, to watch that with my husband sat next to me because we don't watch much telly on our own. Don't know. Yeah. I, it, I, it, it was groundbreaking. It was yeah. absolutely groundbreaking. And you know, she's done me a million favors in terms of my business because I've had loads of inquiries off the back of that documentary saying, you know, we, we want to do something in the workplace. We want to support our female employees. So there is definitely more conversations being had now. And the more we talk about out. it. Yeah. yeah we'll give Davina a shout out. I she love to her anyway. One. Yeah. So yeah, uh, she's done was, a great job. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing all of that with me today, Bev. I'm sure the thank listeners you. will be like going, oh, yes, if they want to carry the conversation on, where's the best place for them to find you? So I'm very heavily visible on LinkedIn, just my name, Bev Thorogood. But I have a Facebook group, Your Best Midlife, which is for women over 40. It is women only. That We deliberately keep it that way just because there's obviously sometimes conversations Sensitive. that go on. They want that safe space. Mm -hmm. If you've got women over 40 listening, they are very, very welcome to come and join me. I don't just talk about menopause. I talk about all sorts of factors that go towards being. We women, we talk yeah. about anything. Absolutely. Living, <laughs> just living your best midlife, whatever that might mean. So, Absolutely. Um, and then on Instagram, I'm, if you search, I think I'm Bev Menopause and Mindset. Because I couldn't get my name. So, but I think if you search Bev Thorogood, you'll find me. We'll find you. Well, we'll make sure that we get all the links into the show notes for the listeners as well. On that note, let's keep talking about the menopause and making those conversations count. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you, Bev. Thank you, Wendy. It's been my pleasure. And there you have it. Isn't it interesting seeing things from somebody else's perspective on something? that fundamentally we've all been dealing with as a species for thousands of years. Now, there's going to be lots more research carrying on on this particular subject. And I'd like to hear from you what your experiences have been, whether you are actually rubbing shoulders with somebody who you think might benefit from listening to this episode with Bev. Don't forget, she's got a book. You can always go and onto the show website, find the link for that. 
and gift it to somebody. You really will brighten up somebody's day. Now, next week, we've got a hole in our bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. Well, actually, it's not really a bucket, but we have got an expert coming to talk to us about funnels. And of course, funnels are really a bucket that's got a hole in it. But more on that with Barnaby Winter next time. There's testing measurement and then there's continuation measurement. And what people move to is they move to the measurement straight away and they say, well, this hasn't worked. And you go, yeah, but you've been doing it for a month. Now we're at the end of the show. There's only one thing that I can ask you to do. And that is, please, if you've really enjoyed listening to the show, please do go and leave us a review on any of the platforms that you're listening today, because that tells those platforms that somebody's really enjoyed it and will help put the show out to more listeners. See you next time. (laughs) 